Friends, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. On this Baptism of the Lord Sunday, we welcome you to Front Street United Methodist Church. Pastor Ross and I are delighted to have you with us wherever you are viewing worship from this morning in the comfort of your homes or with uh, family members or if you're uh, on your own this morning. We are grateful to be in communion with you virtually, even though uh, these times are keeping us physically apart. Uh, A couple of things this morning, just as a reminder, our Luke Bible study is happening Wednesdays at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Uh, Joanna has been sending that link out to you. Next week we'll be starting in chapter 6 with some controversies about what Jesus was doing on the uh, Sabbath and uh, his sermon on the plain uh, in the middle of the Gospel of Luke. And so we hope you'll be able to join us for that and realize that it's in the morning and a lot of you are at work and doing other things, but we're recording all of these sessions And so though it won't be live, you would be able to tune into and follow along with us uh, in the discussions that we're having about the gospel uh, as we delve into the scriptures uh, in this winter season. Also note that in your order of service today, we're going to be reaffirming our covenant uh, in baptism together, uh, one of our sacraments that we uh, uphold uh, as the Church of Jesus Christ And for all of you out there who have been baptized into Christ, into the name of the Trinity, we invite you today to gather some water into a bowl or a vessel of some kind in your home. And when we get to the appropriate moment in the service, you will be able to join with us in touching the waters uh, as we pray over them uh, here and where you are. Um, And remember your baptism and be thankful. And if you're watching this morning and you haven't been baptized, but you are connected to the church We invite you to be in prayer at that time and mindful of the ways that God is working in your life and might be leading you to make that commitment and to acknowledge what God is doing in your life through the gift of the sacrament of baptism. As we begin this morning, I invite you to turn your hearts and minds in prayer and meditation as we begin worship with our prelude.
invite you now to join me in our call to worship this morning. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of God's name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Our opening hymn is When Jesus Came to Jordan. Let us sing together. people who have sinned and who have been sinned against, and yet we are not without hope. For if we confess our sins, God is faithful to hear and to remind us that in Christ we are claimed by God's love. Let us now confess our sins together as we pray together the prayer of confession. Let's join our hearts and our voices. Gracious Gracious Lord, Lord, You whose light and life we share in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we confess that we are people who choose darkness over light. Though you have come into the world and died for the world, we often think only of what benefits our desires. Though we have been invited into the waters of your death and resurrection, we live as if we have not been immersed in your goodness that seeks the welfare of others. Cleanse Cleanse us, O God, that we might be born anew in Christ. Cause us to see afresh the waters of baptism and to recall who we are in our inmost being, wholly beloved by you. For we ask this in his name. Amen. May we take this time to, in silence, offer our confession to God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to to God. God. Amen. Amen. As we come to this time in our worship service where we will remember our baptisms and be thankful, I invite you to bring close the water that you have gathered Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So on behalf 
of the whole church, I ask each of you uh, to respond to these questions, wherever you may be. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please answer, I do. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and embody the grace of Jesus Christ to the world? If so, please answer, I will. I will. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, your mighty acts of salvation have been made known through water. From the moving of your spirit upon the waters of creation to the deliverance of your people through the flood and through the Red Sea. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb, baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. And so, O Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who received it, to wash away their sin and to clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that uh, dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, we ask this prayer. Amen. Amen. Friends, at home, we invite you now, where you are, to touch the waters. Um, as we are doing here. Uh, to simply touch the water, or you can touch it and to make the sign of the cross on your forehead. We invite you to use this moment to remember your baptism and to be thankful. To remember the ways which God has claimed you and your life by His grace. To be disciples and to make disciples of all nations. Friends, may the Holy Spirit work within you that having been born through water and the Spirit, through our reaffirmation here today, you would be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in praying the prayer for illumination? Lord God, you revealed your Son in the waters of the Jordan and anointed him with the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news to all people. Sanctify us by the same Spirit that having received your word this day, we may proclaim the healing power of the gospel by acts of love in your name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture for the day comes from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter beginning in the fourth verse. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance leading to the forgiveness of sins. All of the people from the region of Judea, including all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, were traveling out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This John used to wear a garment made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he would eat grasshoppers and wild honey. And he proclaimed this message, There is coming after me the one stronger than me, of whom I am not worthy so much as to stoop down and loosen his sandals thong. I myself have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As he was coming up out of the water, he immediately saw the heavens being ripped apart and the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved son, in you I have taken delight. This is the word of God for we the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. To God. <coughs> Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. I venture to say there are very few people uh, who wouldn't know Bob Marley's song, Three Little Birds, if they, uh, if they heard it. 
uh, even if they, they don't recognize the name of the song, Three Little Birds. It's one of his most listened to tracks, one of his most beloved songs. Uh, I would say it's not his best song, uh, but it is from what, in my opinion, is his best album, Exodus. Uh, you know the refrain. Don't worry about a thing, because every little thing going to be all right. I can't tell you how many times uh, this catchy and brilliant song has brought me uh, a smile, a sense of reassurance and perspective in times of anxiety and longing. Generally, I think... Uh, Marley's words here would seem like wisdom, but for what the last almost year now has been and what people have revealed of themselves because of how events have unfolded, it's hard to not worry about a thing. It's hard to believe every little thing is going to be all right. But folks seem more on edge, more addled, more anxious. Very few birds have greeted us with the rising sun with words of comfort and reassurance. Now, that's not to say that we live in hopeless times at all, but that the reality of now, of right now, can be crushing. Crushing such that it conceals uh, what hope we have in dark times. Hearing every little thing is going to be all right can actually uh, be offensive. Uh, it can rub against the story that our senses tell us. Uh, and is too vague to offer something real to us ever how much we love the song. And I'm not knocking on Bob Marley. I love him. I'll probably listen to him more than you do. But Marley's words, uh, they fall a little short. And even still, they echo a refrain that has come to us from our faith tradition, the voice of St. Julian of Norwich, who in her collection of visions uh, that were written down while she suffered uh, the plague, she titled it Revelations of Divine Love. She offers this. And thus our good Lord answered all the questions and doubts that I could put forward in prayer, saying most comfortingly, I may make all things well, I can make all things well, and I will make all things well, and I shall make all things well, and you shall see for yourself that all manner of things shall be well. In her vision during her illness, she senses something of not only God's ability, but also God's desire to ensure that humanity comes to understand ourselves as wholly beloved and claimed by God through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Even still, even with her words, the sting of what is true now brushes against the possibility uh, of a restoration that still lies far out ahead of us. As creatures, we need something more sometimes. The three little verses, not three little birds, but three little verses that end this morning's scripture offer that more because they ground us in the truth about who Jesus is and also who we are. They change everything, not because they fast forward us to something, but because they return us to the root and center of our identity, which is found in the incarnate Jesus Christ, the fullness of God in human flesh. We are taken this morning into the moment of Jesus' own immersion into the waters of baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit, and they are reminded of the truth, the truth of, the God, of a God who loves us, a truth that vindicates the past, that interrupts the present, and that promises God's future. But before we get to those three little verses, we need to set the scene a little bit with what comes before at the outset of Mark's gospel. Because Mark's gospel doesn't begin uh, with the same dramatic fashion that Matthew and Luke do, who tell of the tension and the danger that marked the time of Jesus' conception and birth and all the strange and miraculous things that led to that moment. Instead, Mark's gospel begins the good news of Jesus Christ with the words of the prophet Isaiah to make straight a pathway in the wilderness, a way of the Lord. And these words come to us on the lips of John the Baptist in the wilderness. And if you read scriptures, you remember that uh, the wilderness is the place where God meets and leads and teaches people. 
Mark's gospel never ever lingers but moves and is constantly marked by refrains of immediately and straight away and then and then and then. Because God is on the move in Jesus. Mark wants us to understand this, that the reign of God has broken into the world and nothing can stem that tide. With Mark, we hit the ground running and the, sw- the scene, it quickly shifts from Isaiah's words and this mention of John the Baptist to the hunger of the Judean people who had come from far away to John at the banks of the Jordan River to receive his baptism for the forgiveness of sins. A baptism that was not the same as the ritual washing uh, of Judaism and it's not the same as the baptism we receive today. However, it, it is related. You see, it had been generations since a prophet had arisen in Israel. They'd had revolutionaries and warlords in that span of time, but never a prophet. But it came to pass in those days, the Scriptures tell us, when the sons of the tyrant Herod ruled Judea and Samaria and Galilee and Idumea, their pockets lined with Roman coin, and when the people of Israel were subject to their overlords and spiritually deprived, John cried out as a prophet of old, Not of what God plans to do at some future moment, but of what God was doing in their midst. John's voice cries out to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare a way for Jesus. By calling his people, the Jews, to repentance, to turn and to begin begin again from the renewal of God's mercy and forgiveness. And so we come to the three little verses that change everything. I'm going to read them again. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came all the way from Nazareth in Galilee, a long way, and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And as he was coming up out of the water, he immediately saw the heavens being ripped apart and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, in you I have taken delight. Finally, we we come to this intimate scene of Jesus arriving from far away Nazareth to be baptized by John with the people. And here in this coming together, we witness the fullness of the God we call Trinity. The people of Jerusalem and larger Judea, they had come and partaken in John's baptism. They had received the judgment that John had spoke, demanding that they turn towards God that they might live. They recognized what so many people, especially those in power and security, so often fail to recognize, which is their need of forgiveness and mercy. But the whole countryside came, Mark tells us. And they entered into the rough embrace of John's camel hair tunic, his disheveled beard, and his breath hot with locusts and honey. And they were submerged in the water and they were arising as people washed and set on the path of life with God. So the question is asked, why must Jesus be washed in this way? Why would Jesus, who is without sin, walk all that way? Was it to make a scene? It's a good and a puzzling question that Christians have asked for millennia now. Early Christians actually noted their shame at this moment because it seemed as if Jesus was uh, here needs to be washed of sin like any other person and not as the sinless son of God. Karl Barth, who was a theologian of note from the 20th century, observed that Jesus was not being theatrical or merely symbolic when he entered the Jordan River to be baptized. He says something real took place. When Jesus was baptized, he came to be confessed and to be washed of sin, not his sin, but ours. He argues when faced by the sins of all others, he did not judge them from a distance or let these sins be theirs alone. But as the son of his father ordained from all eternity to be the brother of these fatal kindred, these sinful human beings, he caused their sins to be his own sins. No one who came to the Jordan was as laden and afflicted as Jesus. No one was as needy. No one was so utterly human. Bart interprets with us that when Jesus enters the water, he does so in total complete solidarity with all those who are broken or envious or friendless or oppressed or sinful or despairing. He comes as one who would become and take, become all these things himself, take all these things into his body before his death. God with us, God for us. 
John lowers Jesus into the waters, and in John's arms, Jesus is submerged so that all of humankind's sins might be taken into and borne by him unto death. And he emerges from those same waters like the ark from the flood, like his Hebrew ancestors from the muddy depths of the Red Sea, like that generation of Hebrews' children as they crossed the same waters of the Jordan into Canaan, like his own infancy emerging from the water of Mary's womb into the newness. He emerges from the waters into what would be one day his resurrection. And so Jesus comes up from the waters, sopping wet, perhaps rubbing his eyes, and rises to go forth to combat the devil and humanity's suffering of both Jew and Gentile face to face. But not before that pivotal moment, that grounding moment, that central moment, in which he witnesses the heavens being ripped apart, Mark says, ripped apart, and the Spirit descending upon him and moving within him, even as the Father speaks to him, you are my beloved Son, in you I have taken delight. Mark tells us here that God uh, has ripped the heavens apart forever at Jesus' baptism, never to shut them again. That through this gracious gash in the universe... God has poured forth His Spirit onto the earth, never to be withheld. Think about that. Never to be shut again, never to be withheld. A door that's open can always be shut again. But something that's torn apart can't easily be brought back to its former state. It's never going to be as strong as it was before. We might think here of the temple curtain torn apart at Jesus' death, a sign that nothing now or ever will separate people from the full presence of the living God. Jesus joining his fellow Israelites in the waters of the Jordan is indeed a puzzling scene, but this is a powerful moment of oneness that affirms the people's repentance. They're turning towards God and away from sin as the the only proper orientation of their love and their allegiance. No one else can demand those things from us in ways that fully acknowledge our identity, every one of us, as God's beloved children, as those who have, by water and the Spirit, been immersed in Christ. Our lives belong to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, irrevocably. And so the shame of guilt that we carry about things done and left undone, the fear of the unknown and the frightening realities of the world as it is right now, the evil we participate in unknowingly, the sins that we can't seem to kick that blemish our lives to the point that we feel totally alienated from God, none of it has any power to prevent God's grace from centering us on the truth that we are God's beloved sons and daughters. And in us, God is pleased to delight. When we reaffirm our baptism today, as we have, we take up again the covenant to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves, to reject evil and the spiritual forces of wickedness, to reclaim, to state again, to state anew, that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and only Lord and Savior and covenant to serve faithfully with each other as Christ's church in the world that is open to all people. There is never a moment in our lives in which we don't need to be uh, repentant, in which we don't need to be remembered and called back to that grace that gives us our identity as God's beloved children. To repent means simply to turn to be led by the Spirit to perform a 180-degree turn away from what we have been and what we have done and towards God. You could say it's a Godward turn. To forgive and to be forgiven in its original sense means to release, to release the death grip of wrongs that we have done that plague and that shame us and that cause us guilt uh, or those things that have been done to us. Release them. It does not mean that they were okay, It doesn't mean we're off the hook or others are off the hook. It means to be led by God to release what has laid claim to our lives in the form of shame and guilt and wounds so that those things can be healed by God's grace 
so that we can be called back to our identity as God's beloved. These three little verses uh, promise that what is said of Jesus is said also of us. The waters of baptism, whenever they're poured over us, whether we're infants or adults, confirms the bond that God has created between himself and Jesus as belonging to us as well. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Spirit and this Holy Spirit, we are God's and God is ours. Because our faith teaches us that the grace of the Trinity is always inclusive and free and ever expanding. It claims us completely. There's no one that lies outside of its embrace. More than any label or condition we or anyone else could put on uh, love or on our self-worth. No one gets to tell us who we are. Only God has that privilege. Not our friends, not our enemies, not an abusive spouse or partner, not a political party or a political figure, neither our own shame, neither the mask that we want others to see, the false self we put on. Only God And God says over us the very words spoken over Jesus. You are my son, you are my daughter, my beloved. In you, I take delight. We are people born of water and of the spirit, not of ideology and idols. And we need a God who from the sight of our own flesh tells us definitively who we are. Not just words, but embodiment. We need a God who lives and dies with us from within suffering and not without it. We need a God who washes clean but also burns away the identities that we craft for ourselves or the identities that are impressed upon us by influences that would use people instead of love people. We need a God who through baptism teaches us that we will never look into the eyes of someone whom God does not love completely. And so may we today be reminded of this sacred truth gifted to us in our baptism. In Jesus' baptism, this truth that we share, the truth that vindicates our past, that interrupts our presence, and that promises us God's future of grace and redemption for all people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Most holy and loving God, it is true that we want to find our truths in things like songs and TV shows and movies and podcasts and social media. We want the words, every little thing going to be all right, to be our truth. It's because we've become an impatient people. We've become a people ingrained in 30-minute TV shows where everything outside of commercials in the 23 minutes of the show is brought to a climax and resolved within that time period. And we think that Everything should be like that. We think that we are the primary characters and that we are what matters most. We forget that we are part of your story. We are not the story. And that brings us grief, it brings us frustration. but you're so patient with us. You truly are our heavenly father. You accept us as we are, challenging us to grow just as a good parent does with a child. And even in the midst of our grieving and our frustration and our stomping of our feet, you love us. So much so that you send your son, who we read about in these wonderful gospels, the people who got to see him and witness him, 
we get to hear about and believe in and come to know through faith. We come mindful of our sin, mindful of our shortcomings and not really sure what to do about it, but that's okay because you already know your son came and took it all on himself and he stands in the gap for us and presents us to you covered in his blood. Grace. Story of grace. And we are so grateful that you look at us and you see us through him and with him you say to us you are my beloved children I love you and I want you with me and I will bring to all of what groans around you I will bring it to resolution the way that I know that it needs to be and it may not be to your satisfaction But if you trust me, it will be the way that I know it should be. And you will see. And you will believe. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the words of our message today. Thank you for the words of the gospel. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son and for the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. We lift this thanks to you in the name of the one who came and when he was among us taught us to pray saying, Our Our Father Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy thy name. Thy thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy Thy will be be done done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God gives to you to me and we can do nothing else but give in return give back to him give back to the church and give to the world with the same love that we received I invite you to pray about how you will support the church whether it's by texting or giving online or, or mailing or by service or uh, giving of your time and your prayers, all of it is coveted. May we take this time to offer the fullness of ourselves, including, including our tithes and gifts as we take this offering to God.
Friends, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.